Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, just, uh, we're going to look at liquid-liquid extraction today, um, potentially wrap up the topic. What I just uh, quickly wanted to start with was just to update you quick on the midterms. Um, they're 80%, 85% graded, um, so I will, I'll get them back to you next week. It's just, as you're aware, this class is about 105 students. It may not look like it today. But there are 105 of you registered for the course, plus with the collaborative midterm, that adds 25% extra load. Um, so it's taken a little longer than normal, plus uh, those of you that are in 4N know that I have 20 meetings this week with all of you, so um, I'm finding it a little hard to, to keep up to date, but I will get them done over the weekend and return to you next week. Um, so far, the grades look pretty good, so I'm, I'm quite happy with where, uh, where the class is heading. Um, so let's, let's go back. Uh, to where we were on the class on Wednesday. And we were looking at this triangular diagrams, which you should be pretty comfortable with now and using. So we were using the lever rule to locate various points on the diagram. So let's just back up. Uh, we started with a pure solvent and a feed in this example. And we know that once we mix that solvent and that feed, that we're going to have a mixture at point M. Okay, so that mixture at point M um, is mixed over there and then we allow it to separate and here this diagram draws the two devices as a separate uh, piece but in, we've seen various configurations of equipment that that could happen in one in the same unit. Now that mixture M um, it's it's a mixture point it's not supposed to represent the entire mixture in the system it's a mixture point so it's a hypothetical conceptual point that we use and the thinking is that even in a continuous system coming in You've got continuous feed of solvent at that flow rate of S. You've got a continuous feed of flow rate capital F. So coming into the mixer here are those two S plus F. And then leaving at the settler or the separator, you've got the extract and then the raffinate. Okay. So we've called this term the mixture. We've called this term the mixture as well. M is both the sum of the two inputs. M is also the sum of the two outputs because at steady state, the solvent plus the feed must add up to the extract plus raffinate. So that, that's conceptually easy to understand. Uh, what people sometimes struggle with is the idea that M is the mixture point and it's not the total mass of material in the system. Okay, um, It's also not the accumulation happening in the system because at steady state we have zero accumulation. So M is simply a conceptual point that represents the mass of solvent plus the mass of feed coming together and contacting each other. Because at the same time that that mass M is entering, that same is also leaving in the extract and raffinate. So we're replacing new solvents and feed and we're pulling out old extract and raffinate. And so we always have this new mass of M coming in and this mass of M leaving. The key insight is that within that separator and mixer system, we are reaching equilibrium. We have to reach equilibrium. And if we do so, if we reach equilibrium, that mixture M will settle out into two streams, E1 and R1. And we spent last class figuring out what those flow rates were. We use the lever rule for that. Um, and what we also then read off the diagram, the moment we have those two points, we have the three compositions represented by E1 for carrier solvent and extract. Uh, sorry, carrier solvent and species A. And we have the three compositions at R1. Okay, so we can get those pretty quickly. So what I'd actually asked you to do uh, last time was I gave you this exercise to do at home. Um, I handed out the phase diagrams for you as well in the class. There are also as PDFs on the course website. And I'll give you a minute or two to take this information down. If you did that work, uh, you would have got the... Uh, those answers. So I'll, I'll give you a second to copy them down in case you haven't had a chance to do that yet.
Okay, so the key numbers you want to note are the flow rates of E1 and R1. Um, that you should have been able to calculate those. It's, uh, it's, uh, a, should be a comfortable calculation for you. And then reading off the compositions from point E1 and R1 should be something that's also um, something that's easy. So I will post these PDFs as well uh, for you, but uh, that's, that's the solution. So let's just quickly understand what's going on. Here we were told the feed composition that locates point F for us. We were told the solvent composition which locates this point here. Uh, furfural was the solvent in this instance. And uh, the next question is where's that mixture capital M? How do I know that that green point is where it is? As I showed last class, you can either do that by a mass balance or you can use the lever rule. Um, either way, you can locate point M. And then when point M comes to equilibrium, it splits along a tie line. And since point M is not at a tie line, we have to visually interpolate a little bit. So everyone's answer for E1 and R1 might differ slightly from the mine given here. And that's quite acceptable. Um, within a few, uh, one or two percent, you'll get slightly different composition values here. Um, and also, of course, if your point E1 and R1 at slightly different locations to mine, you'll get slightly different masses for E1 and R1. They won't necessarily be 82 and 218, but they, they'll be close. Okay. So make sure you, uh, you work through that. That's a second example, um, the same as the one we looked at in class last time. So in the midterm uh, review that you guys gave me a lot of good feedback for, uh, one of the things was asking for more examples. And so you'll see today's class is mostly examples. Here's another one for you to work on in your own time. Um, now, what I wanted to talk about next is the visual picture that we've got going here is we've got my feed coming in, my solvent coming in. I've got my raffinate and I've got my extract. And what we're doing next is we're saying, well, what happens if I contact that material a second time? We had this idea in the previous class that that raffinate leaving here, R1, we didn't quite extract as much solute from it as we would have liked. So what we do is we contact it a second time. So I send that onto another mixer and another settler. So let's call this R1 and E1 to differentiate the first mixer from the second mixer, and settler. And I also now get to pick a different solvent flow rate, S2. I don't have to use the same solvent flow as I used in the first mixer settler. I can vary that. That's in my control. And so in the second unit, I've got a different solvent flow, not a different solvent composition, a different solvent flow. Okay. And so that means that when we look at the second unit, now drawn here in orange, the solvent is at the same point. Remember, the, the, the val nothing on this diagram tells us flow rates. This diagram is only related to compositions. So that solvent composition is still the same solvent. The new feed coming into the second unit is R1. And so then I locate that mixture M2 on this, on this orange line. Mixture two will then also come to equilibrium. And in my second unit leaving, then I have E2 and R2 shown in green over there. So they equilibrate exactly in the same way before. And we've now got an extract composition E2 that's lower than the first one. And our raffinate composition is much lower as well. So Every, every unit subsequent does less and less work as it is, as it were, to extract that solute. And we can keep going a third time and a fourth time in this, in this way. And in fact, what I would encourage you to do is, let's, let's step back a little bit, interestingly, to this one that you just wrote the answers down for. If you look at this diagram, this is a different system. Actually, in this case, the tie lines work against you. If you notice, the extract is the stream that we would like to actually contain a whole lot of solute. But notice here that the extract stream composition for solute is much, much lower than the raffinate, R1. Okay? So this is a perfect system to then contact a second time. So your second time, your R2 might land over here, R3, R4, R5. You'll need several stages for this particular system 
to get that raffinate composition right down to a small number. Okay? So contrast that system to the one that we just looked at now, this system over here. This system, the tie lines actually work in our favor to bring that raffinate composition right down even within one or two steps. So this solvent that's been ch used in this system is actually advantageous to us. The tie lines move us in a desirable direction. In this other system I showed you, the tie lines work against us a little bit, and we're going to have to have several stages to get that raffinate composition down from R1, R2, R3, R4, and eventually down. Yeah. Why would you ever use that solvent that makes this cost? Or? It might be cost. It might be one of the only suitable solvents that works for this solute. It's just not great. It's just not the best one. It's still doable, but you'll just need a few more steps. Okay, okay so, so that's um, what this sort of construction where you've got multiple units in a row is called cross flow. So it's, you've got your solvent crossing your feed every time. And what you're going to do at the end is you're going to collect your three extract streams up. Collect those three extract streams. And what you're interested in is that concentration. Once you add up those three extract streams, you blend them together, your solute now should be, there's a lot of solute in E1, less solute in E2, even less solute in E3. You're going to combine the, the three of those streams up, divided by the total extract flow rate, and that will give you your blended concentration. And then the other number that you're interested in is your overall recovery. Your overall recovery is an easy value to calculate. You simply use the composition of that last raffinate stream, which now is hopefully a very small number in the numerator. A small number in the numerator divided by your feed mass flow. Subtract that from one. Okay, so the more stages you have, the smaller that numerator becomes and the closer you get to 100% recovery of your solute. So that's a straightforward equation there. Okay, but now we're going to take it a little further and we recognize that when we've got this sort of cross-current system, every time you have to bring in a fresh solvent, fresh S1, fresh S2, fresh solvent 3, the solute amount needed for that sort of arrangement is very, very high. And so we can essentially look at a countercurrent system. A countercurrent system, we've learned about countercurrent in heat exchangers. You know that a countercurrent system in that scenario is, is more efficient use of your heat and your energy. It's no different here for mass transfer. When we're dealing with a countercurrent system, we get more efficient use of that solvent. We essentially reuse it in every stage. And what you can show is you can get away to get the same recovery, you need far less solvent. Okay, so that's a, a really, really powerful setup. And if you look at it, really, from a capital cost point of view, you don't need any more equipment. In the cross flow system that I've drawn here, here you need two physical units, mixing and settling, mixing and settling. With countercurrent, you still need two physical units. You've just put the piping in different directions. So a very simple change to the physical system gets you a far better overall concentrations and recoveries. The question that we now have to answer is how many stages? Okay? And what we're heading towards here is very much the same as you looked at in distillation um, in 3M where you draw a diagram where you step, step off the diagram. So do multiple steps like a McCabe Thiel type construction, except here we're not going to use a McCabe Thiel diagram, an XY diagram, we're going to use that triangular diagram to do our work. So let's, let's get to that derivation a bit and um, you're going to see how that works. I will just, uh, before we get to that discussion, just quickly want to talk a bit about this idea of how big should the units be. Um, how, how, if you're looking at doing this in a column, right? I showed you some column examples last time. Let's, let's maybe take a look at some pictures here. I found some others for you on this website for column type, type units. So here's a rotating disc contactor column. And 
essentially each stage in this column can be considered as a mixer settler. And you've got counter current flow. So you've got your light phase flowing up, your heavy phase flowing down. So that's counter current over there. The question comes, how many plates, how many trays do you need? Okay, that's a rotating disc contactor where the central shaft rotates. You can also get uh, this arrangement um, where you've got, instead of a flat disc rotating, you now actually put an impeller in there um, rotating inside the similar arrangement. Or the car column, um, this is a column which pulsates. So the internals in the column pulsate, but still your light fluid flows up, your heavy fluid flows down. So that's a, 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 me a mechanical pulsation. Um, or you can have this sort of arrangement here where we just zoom in. Um, again, light phase flowing up, heavy phase flowing down. But this case, what you do is you use a solenoid valve and a compressed air, and you alternate between injecting air and liquid, air and liquid. So instead of having moving parts, you move the fluid and pulsate it with air um, compressed air. Okay? So I'll post those four hyperlinks to the course website for you to investigate. And the interesting part is, the, of course, the pictures, but is the discussion that they have here alongside and indicating to you when um, each column is more suitable to the other. Uh, this is the settling, where that settling is occurring. So your heavy, your heavy liquid is coming down, and you're, you're allowing it to settle there before pumping it out to, to decouple the heavy from the light. So wouldn't that mean that there's like the rest of the column is packed with more light phase going up, though? Okay, yeah, you've got the light phase going up. Similarly, that top of the column there is all light phase, yeah. and, and the heavier, heavier material has sunk. So in the cent this middle part of the column, that's all mixed. You're assuming that's all mixed. It okay. is all mixed, yeah. Yeah, and that's what the pulsation or the air jets encourages. Okay. So when we do these calculations, um, we have essentially that each one of those trays is a step on your triangular diagram. So we're going, if we need five steps on our triangular diagram to get the separation we need, we're going to need five theoretical trays. But a theoretical tray doesn't necessarily translate into an actual tray. So we were comfortable with this idea from distillation column that you take your number of theoretical stages divided by the stage efficiency. So each, tray may, each physical tray might only be 30% efficient. So you'll need about three real trays for every single theoretical tray. And then the, the vendors of these equipment, they also have a number that they know internally, the height equivalent to a theoretical stage. So they know that each theoretical stage corresponds to a certain height. Height is basically what defines how long your material contacts for. So that height then gives you um, the height of each stage multiplied by the number of stages required gets you the total height of the column. And so you'll see, um, let's get some pictures here, some examples of, the, of these columns. So there is a, a column on the left-hand side, that's that rotating disc column. The very first uh, diagram I showed you, the RDC, um, it's, it's a pretty tall device, right, to get that separation occurring. Um, this company here, a wind tray, a Japanese company, um, where I took the image from, their, their technology is shown there on the right-hand side, and the internals of that are shown um, a little bit over there. So we're seeing essentially you've got your heavy liquid coming in and their, their patents of technology is how this flow leaves one tray and cascades down onto the next and you've got your lighter phase coming up through there. Okay, so you've got this sort of bubbling effect, this cross flow happening. So it's a, still a counter current just in a single column. Any questions on that before we start looking at the, the derivation for it? Yeah. That's, uh, that column is in, totally filled with liquid. The lighter phase moving up and the heavier phase moving down. There's no air in that. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the, the derivation here for this system. 
So I'm going to start with the simplest possible counter current example, and that's two stages. And what we see here is we've got your solvent coming in on the, on the right hand side, and your feed coming in on the left. And leaving each stage, let's just pay attention to the uh, notation here. The stream leaving stage one are labeled with subscript one. So E1 leaves stage one, R1 leaves stage one, even though they're going in different directions. The subscript refers to the stage that it's leaving. Now, we can write an overall mass balance for the entire system. So F plus S equals E1 plus R2. Okay, so it's an overall mass balance. And if I drew a boundary around this entire system over there, so if I compress all those stages together and draw a boundary around all of it, there is still this theoretical point M in the inside of all of that. Okay? So I'll show you that boundary on the next slide. Um, we can also go do a mass balance across each stage. So here's the first stage, F plus E2 coming in equals R1 plus E1. And similarly for the second stage. So there's nothing um, too exciting about that. But what, what we notice is let's go play around with these equations a little bit. Let's go rearrange this first equation, F, bring the E1 over to the left, and take the E2 over to the right. Okay. And let's go do the same thing with the second equation bring E2 over to the left and take S over to the right. And now what you notice is that you have this R1, E2 term and R1 and E2 term in both equations. So we can set all of these equal to each other. F minus E1, R1 minus E2, R2 minus S. And we're going to call this a new point, P. It's a differencing point. Again, it's a theoretical point, F minus E1. Let's take a look. There's F, the lower stream, minus the upper stream. R1, the lower stream, minus E2, the upper. R2, the lower, minus S, the upper. So it's always got that consistent pattern to it as well. So this point P is a differencing point. And what you can also see is, I'm just going to write those equations in a slightly different way. F equals E1 plus P. Okay, so where did that equation come from? F F equals E1 plus P. So there's P. Take the E1 over to the right-hand side. R1 equals E2 plus P. And R2 equals S plus P. So you can create these three equations. Okay, everyone comfortable with that up to now? Okay, so now the interesting thing is going to happen. We're going to use the lever rule. And this idea that when you mix E1... So consider E1 and mix it with P. Now P doesn't actually exist. It's a fictitious point. But we know that if on a diagram I connect E1, so in my triangular diagram there might be E1, there might be P. In general, the rule is that when we sum those two up, F is going to be somewhere between those two points. We know that from from the, the rules that govern that triangular diagram. Except the interesting thing is that P is not where, where you might think it is. Okay? P is going to be in a little bit of an unusual place. So let's take a look at this. this is, um, we'll build this up slowly for you. So let's look at a, a counter current system. We're going to step this up slowly. I've got a feed F of 250 kilograms and I have a solvent coming in at 100 kilograms. And there's the compositions of them. So F coming in at the bottom here and S coming in at the top. The mixture M is the mixture that's inside this purple boundary. Where is that? I can find that point M doing an overall balance and or using the lever rule, either way. Okay, so we're all comfortable with finding point M. Now, when we work cross-current, remember we set up the equations for these systems on the board last time. We always have to specify what our goal is. And our goal this time is we want to achieve 
a certain composition in the raffinate leaving. The raffinate is this stream R2. I'd like that to be a certain composition, so I specify that. I'm going to pick a value that I would like to achieve. In this example, I'm going to use 0 0.05. Okay, so we, we define where we would like to end up. That's what's a little bit different from the previous example. The previous example, we keep stepping and, and zigzagging along tie lines until we get to a desired R2. In this case, we have to tell what we would like R2 to be, and then we're going to figure out the number of stages to get to that. Okay, so R2 is over there. Now, let's put up, I'm just going to write up over here those, those three equations that we had earlier. And here's what I'd like you to notice. We say that whenever we write this equation like this, it says that if we mix E1 plus P, we're going to get point F lying somewhere on that line. If we mix S plus point P, we're going to find R2 somewhere in between that line. So take a look at that. Here I've got R2. Let's look at the, use the last equation. R2 is going to be on the line that connects S plus P. So R2 is somewhere in the middle of the line that connects S plus P. So where does P have to be? Okay. And we're actually going to step outside the triangle a little bit. So P must be somewhere over here so that when we connect S plus R2, uh, sorry, when we connect S plus P, that R2 is somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, so we're going that that hasn't quite told us where P is. We just we know that P is going to be somewhere out there. S plus R2, P is going to be somewhere over here. So if I draw a line, where along this line is P? To locate P, I need another point, another line to intersect it. Okay. So to get that second line, we step back and look at that diagram there a bit, and we can figure it out as follows. We know F, we know S, and because we know those two, we know the mixture in the middle there. But what we also have is the second part of the equation, E1 plus R2 equals M. Okay. So we, we have two pieces there. We know where R2 is. We know where M is, so we can figure out what E1 is, okay? We can figure out where E1 is based on that uh, lever rule, because I know where M is, I know where R2 is, so I can find where E1 is, okay? So if I apply the lever rule, And the lever rule says that M and R2 must be on a straight line. In fact, I, I don't even really have to use the lever rule. I can simply connect R2 to M and just keep going with the line. Okay. But you'll find that the lever rule also does work. And E1 and R2 will be on the equilibrium envelope. Yeah. So it always hits the border of the envelope? Or you it always hits the border of the envelope because we're assuming these are equilibrium stages. We've reached equilibrium. Okay, so is everyone clear on that construction so far? Okay, so there's my mixture in the middle. It has, what I really want to emphasize, and people get, get stuck on this, is that E1 and R2 are not along a tie line. This is critical. E1 and R2 are not connected on a tie line. Those, the blue line there is not going in between or interpolating a tie line. We know that because E1 does not actually contact R2, so there's no way that they can be in equilibrium. <coughs> They're not settling along an equilibrium <coughs> line. Okay, now that we know those, four, those five points in the diagram, we can actually go use this equation now. 
because I know where E1 is, I know where F is, and then I can go figure out and project out point P. Okay, so there's the, there's the construction to find point P. E1, F, P, I draw that green line all the way out to some, just keep going and going. I know that S, R2, and P must be on a line that connect each other, and where those two meet, that's point P. The, ne the final step here is if we look at this diagram, we know E1, I know S, I know R2, I know F, but I don't have E2 and I don't have R1. Okay, that's my last two pieces of information. I need to complete that. I don't know E2 and I don't know R1, but I've got two pieces of information to find that. Here's the first piece of information. I know that E2 and R1 must be on a line connecting through P. Okay, that's piece. So two unknowns. This is the way to think about it is that you need E2 and you need R1. So two unknowns. You're going to need two pieces of information to find them. Here's the first piece of information. You know that E2 and R1 are in a straight line through P. The second piece of information is that you can use the diagram to find the equilibrium compositions. And the way we know that is E1 must be in equilibrium with R1. So E1 is over here. It must be in equilibrium with R1. So I can use the tie lines and come through the tie lines and find where that point is. So E1 is over there. Let's follow the, the two tie lines. We've got to interpolate between those two dashed lines. So I know R1 has got to be somewhere in this neighborhood over here. Is that clear? Okay, we're going to get a chance to do this ourselves uh, in a different example, but let's just follow that again. E1 is over there. It must be in equilibrium with R1. So it, it, don't follow the blue line. It's, it's just over there where my finger is. Okay, so that's your, your next construction on the diagram. I've taken away some of the other lines just to avoid the clutter. E1 and R1 are in equilibrium with each other in purple. So that's my second piece of information, and then I can go um, finish that up. And I know E1, sorry, E2 and R1 are on the same line through P. Okay, so essentially what P becomes is your operating point where you're going to, every single stage goes and passes through point P. Okay. So I'm going to just leave it at that. Um, I'm going, yes, sorry, Michelle. Quick question, could we affirm E2 the same way? Just by following the tie line for E2? Um, E2 is your desired endpoint. Oh, sorry, E2, sorry, ask your question again. Yeah, you can. And, but what you're hoping is that you, you're assuming that R2 is there. Or you hope for that R2 is there. In this case, your second stage does land up there. I'm going to show you that in a, in a system where the lines are not so close to each other, and then you'll see it come together. Okay? So what we're going to work through here is essentially a system with multiple stages. Now, the same idea propagates through. In fact, the hardest part is just setting up the problem. And so to set up the problem here on slide 61, I've given you the exact steps to do so. Um, now what I'm going to hand out is a tutorial example for you to try that out. And you're going to work through those uh, eight steps. And let's just set it up quickly. We're going to use a counter current system with pure um, solvent and carrier and solute in the feed. The feed stream comes at 112 kilograms per hour. And we're going to counteract that with a solvent flow. So ignore the gray part. I'll, I'll come back to that later on. We're going to then feed a solvent flow of 28 kilograms per hour. So my feed is at 112. My solvent is at 28. We're going to go counter current. What I'd like you to do on this handout is just do those first few steps where you find essentially the mixture point M. So find that mixture point M, find the final point R2 where you'd like to be, and you can even start finding the first point P. Okay, so let's go through this. This is something we have to be comfortable with by the end of the class.
Okay, so if you can uh, do those four steps, then everything after that uh, becomes a little simpler. The hardest part is setting up the problem, as I said. Thanks. So feel free to make mistakes. There's two sides to the copy. There's spares here as well if you need more. I'm actually going to speed this up just a little bit for you because finding M is something that we looked at in the previous class. Finding M is the same as the, the furfural example that you had a chance to do at home. So that should be um, something you don't need to spend a lot of time on. So let's use that point M that's given there. It's at the intersection of a multiple number of lines. So it's pretty easy to locate. It's at the 80-20 line. So that step is pretty straightforward. What I'd really like you to do is, is the next step where you specify what Rn is, find E1, that's the point that passes through the mixture line, and then find P.
Okay, so Rn then is at uh, 0.025%. And um, what that is, it says essentially we would like our, our raffinate leaving from the very last stage, Rn, that very final stream is we'd like to only be 2.5% by weight. So that's that composition of that point over there, Rn. And we know that it's at this location on the, on the equilibrium curve because that last stage, in fact, every stage is assumed to be at equilibrium. So we know that it's got to be on that arc, the equilibrium arc, but an Rn is at 0.25. So everyone clear on why Rn is over there? Sorry? For its solute. We're, we're only ever really interested in the solute. Okay. Yes? No? Yeah? Okay. So Rn 0 0.025 uh, weight percent. So we know that Rn is there. What we now do is we do a, a global mixture balance. So mixture M. So we know that M must equal E1 plus Rn. Since we know where Rn is, we know that M is at that point. We just keep drawing a straight line through and landing up at E1. Okay, so that way, actually what's really nice about this is that you can, with just this very simple construction, quickly calculate what your extract composition is and your extract flow. You don't actually even need to know what goes on in between any of these systems, just this very simple construction very rapidly tells you what that outcoming extract composition can possibly be. Okay? So under the assumption that we, meet, we have equilibrium in every stage, we don't even know how many stages we need. Right? This is interesting. We, we haven't even figured out whether we need five stages, ten stages. This diagram simply tells you how, what the best possible E1 can be now we're going to figure out how many stages we need to get to that E1. So if you're designing the system, your, your, your goal is to specify Rn. You want to know what raffinate composition you want, and then that will automatically tell you what your extract is. You could also do it the other way around. You could specify E1, pass the line through M, and figure out what your corresponding Rn is. Okay, so it works both both ways. Either you could specify Rn or you could specify E1. Doesn't matter which one you specify, it passes through the diagonal and, and through point M. Okay, so now we know where E1 is. The next step is to find P. Okay. And we know where P um, is. We need two lines to locate P. The first line is that S plus P equals Rn. So we can derive that equation. We know then that S and Rn are on a straight line through P. The second um, piece of information to find P is that we know that E1 plus F passes on a, on a line through P. So draw a line through S and Rn, draw a line through E1 and F, and where those lines intersect is where we'll find point P. Okay. And the reason why that, those equations work, remember I showed you the, the, the pattern that you can remember to find the equation for P, is that P is always the difference between 
the lower line and the upper line. So if we look at this diagram, P is the difference between Rn minus S. It's the difference between F minus E1. So that holds at the inlets, it holds at the outlet side. It also holds at every single point in between. Okay, P is always going to be the difference between those two quantities. So in particular, we'll use the first one and the last one to locate point P. And then later on, we're going to use the in-between values to step off and find our number of stages. So I'm going to let you do that uh, part for homework, and we'll resume it. But what I wanted to show you just where P is located, you should have found P out there. It sort of just makes it to the edge of the page. Okay. And then what I'd like you to do is step off with the next, the next stage. So we're going to start at stage one and work our way from left to right. So essentially, if we look at stage one, we know F, we know E1, we don't know E2, and we don't know R1. Okay? But what we do know, however, is that E1 is in equilibrium with R1. These two values are in equilibrium with each other. So you can equilibrate E1 and then find R1. So let's, let's just quickly zigzag here. I'm going to show you this, then we'll resume it next time. Once you find E1, you can equilibrate it with R1. Once you know R1, you can go find E2 using the difference of P. Once you know E2, you're going to come down, up, down, up. You're just going to keep stepping on that graph. So I'm going to ask you, and this is, um, I'm being actually quite serious. This is something you must do over the weekend, right? So next class, I'll show you the solution. In fact, you have it in your slides already, so you can go verify it for yourself. But this is something you must try out and be comfortable with. 